Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. In our recent episode about Paul Cuffey, we mentioned just really briefly that after King Philip's war, indigenous men in New England were enslaved and sent to the Caribbean. And that felt like a pretty big thing to just drop into an episode without explaining it more. Especially since we have only really mentioned King Philip's War in passing on the show, it came up as part of the context in our episodes on Bacon's Rebellion. Also, way back in 2015, it was part of the context for um, our our show on the Sham Battle and the Kohiko Massacre, which we're going to have as a Saturday classic soon for folks who haven't heard that. King Philip's War was an armed conflict primarily between English colonists and indigenous nations in what's now New England, although there were also some indigenous peoples who were allied with the colonists. And it took place primarily between 1675 and 1676. In terms of per capita deaths, it's been described as the deadliest war in U.S. history, and it had a massive ongoing collection of ramifications for indigenous people and for the colonists in and around New England. Sometimes it's called the First Indian War, but that name and King Philip's War are both misnomers, and we will be talking about that uh, as we go along. So to set up some context... Plymouth Colony was the first permanent British settlement in New England, established after about 100 people arrived aboard the Mayflower in 1620. About 40 of the people aboard the Mayflower were Puritans. These were members of a religious reform movement that believed that the Church of England was corrupt and retained too many Catholic influences after the Protestant Reformation. Other English colonies followed that one. This included the Massachusetts Bay Colony, established in 1629 and named after the indigenous Massachusetts nation living in the area. Roger Williams founded Rhode Island Colony in 1636 after being banished from Massachusetts. The Connecticut Colony was established the same year, with its name coming from an Algonquin word meaning beside the long tidal river. Throughout this whole time, between 1630 and 1640, thousands more people migrated to North America from Britain, many of them Puritans, who believed that this so-called new world was theirs by divine decree. The region where English colonists were establishing settlements was home to numerous indigenous tribes and nations, many of them Algonquin-speaking peoples. The Wampanoag Nation alone included 69 different tribes. And these societies were highly interconnected through economics and through kinship, including an extensive trading network that spanned throughout New England. The colonists became part of and influenced this network as they brought different trade goods, including firearms, to this whole system. English colonization of North America required colonists to get land, or at least the rights to use the land from the local indigenous people. And especially in the earlier decades of colonization, a lot of these land deeds read a lot more like treaties than straightforward purchase agreements. In a lot of cases, the colonist was given the right to use the land, but the deed also included some kind of provisions for an indigenous family or community to keep living on or using that land in some way. Deeds also often included some kind of lifetime payment on the part of the colonist, something along the lines of a bushel of corn. This was similar to what indigenous families were expected to contribute to their own communities. So from the indigenous point of view, English colonists were becoming part of their interconnected community that was already made up of lots of different nations and peoples. The colonists were gaining access to the land, but also contributing to the community with the goods that the land produced. But from the English point of view, it was more like they were buying the land outright and continuing to have some kind of payment long term with this uh, bushel of corn or something similar every year. And this disparity on how each side understood this was complicated by the fact that very few people in the colonies were fluent in both English and an Algonquin language. In most cases, the negotiating parties might speak some of one another's language, but not fluently. This gives me a brief flashback to Thomas Harriet and his visit to the Americas under Sir Walter Raleigh and how he put some of these ideas in motion that 
led to all of these problems going forward. Uh, On top of having fundamentally different ways of understanding these transactions, English colonists also wanted access to more and more land as their population grew, and as the first generation of English children born in North America reached adulthood. It was expected that firstborn sons would inherit land from their fathers. These firstborn sons thought of this inheritance as their birthright and something that was exclusively theirs, not something that they shared with their indigenous neighbors. So because of this need to get more and more land, negotiations for the land and the deeds that came out of those negotiations became increasingly exploitive and absolute in terms of the rights that the English people were getting. More and more of the deeds were signed under duress. This included things like the English taking someone captive and refusing to release them until they had signed their land over. A lot of these deeds included no more provisions about the indigenous people's continued use of the land. And then that led to disputes within indigenous communities as people, especially women, realized that the land that they had been cultivating or living on had been sold without their involvement and with no provision made for them. It also wasn't just people who were encroaching onto indigenous land as this situation progressed. Colonists introduced a lot of domesticated livestock to North America, including cattle and pigs. Colonists fenced their own crops and then allowed their livestock to roam and graze freely. Much of the plant life and grazing land back in Britain was well adapted to being eaten and stomped on by grazing livestock and then having the seeds of those plants propagated through dung. The plants in North America were not adapted in the same way. As the colonists' animals encroached onto indigenous land, they tore up that land, and they were incredibly destructive to cultivated crops. This wasn't restricted to just, you know, planted crops that someone was cultivating, which the animals did trample and eat a lot of. The colonists' domestic animals also destroyed things like clam beds and woodland berry bushes that people gathered from. And when indigenous people complained about this destruction of their crops and their other food sources, for the most part, the colonists just told them to build fences rather than doing anything to contain their own animals. Among the Wampanoag and other Algonquin-speaking peoples, women were generally the people who cultivated and managed this cropland, producing food for their own families and their whole communities, and for trade with the colonists and other indigenous nations. And colonial records are full of indigenous women's efforts to resolve this and to protect and fairly distribute what remained of their community's food stores. Whether something was about a land deed or animal encroachment or some other dispute, the English colonists expected indigenous people to follow English colonial law and to seek restitution through colonial courts. One justification for this on the part of the colonists was their belief that the indigenous people were primitive and heathens who needed to be converted to Christianity and taught the ways of English society. Another justification was that in a lot of cases, an indigenous leader or someone else speaking for a tribe had made some kind of allegiance to the colony, which the colony regarded as a commitment to follow colonial law. But in general, these courts were skewed in favor of the colonists. So the colonists were forcing indigenous people to resolve disputes in a legal system that was stacked against them. Court decisions could be particularly egregious, like enforcing the terms of a land deed only if an indigenous family surrendered all its weapons, when those weapons were needed for both hunting and defense and were necessary to the family's survival. All of this was also happening in the context of an indigenous population that had been reduced dramatically due to introduced diseases, especially smallpox. A smallpox epidemic in 1633 and 1634 killed an estimated 70% of the indigenous population of the Northeast. King Philip's War wasn't the first time that all of this fed into a violent conflict, which is why it's not really accurate to call it, quote, the First Indian War. As it is sometimes known, you'll read that in various uh, places. Although there had been violent conflicts on a smaller scale going back to the beginning of a European presence in what is now New England, the first sustained conflict in these English colonies was the Pequot War, fought mainly in what is now Connecticut in 1636 and 1637. In addition to all these things that we've just discussed, another influence in the Pequot War was trading relationships with the Dutch and the Pequot nation's existing relationships with its indigenous neighbors. 
The Pequot Nation had extended its influence throughout the region through military conquest and intermarriage and diplomacy, and it had become the most powerful indigenous nation in the area. At the end of the war, though, most of the Pequot fighting force had been killed. The surviving women and children were mostly captured and enslaved and sent to two tribes that had sided with the English in this conflict. After the Pequot War, relationships between the indigenous people and the colonists were relatively free from violence for the next few decades. We're going to get to how that changed after we have a quick sponsor break. The King Philip of King Philip's War was Medicom, also known as Medicomet or Pometicom. These kinds of name changes were really common among the Wampanoag. He was the sachem, or leader, of the Poconoket Wampanoag, and the name King Philip came from the English colonists. They basically gave him a name after Philip of Macedon. Metacom's father was Osamequin, also known as the Massasoit sachem, or Great Sachem. You'll often see him called Massasoit as though that was his name, but that is really a title. He was the intertribal leader of the Wampanoag Nation when the Mayflower arrived in 1620. He signed a treaty with the colonists and maintained relatively peaceful relations with them. He was present at the meal that has become commemorated as the first Thanksgiving. Yeah, that colonists basically survived with the help of Osamequin and the rest of the Wampanoag. Osamequin died in 1661, and his son Wemsuda became sachem. English colonists called Wemsuda Alexander after Alexander the Great, but he died suddenly in 1662. The English had arrested him under suspicion that he was planning some kind of uprising with the Narragansett people, something there was not actually any evidence for, and he had suddenly become very ill while he was imprisoned. A lot was suspicious about this. English authorities also maintained that Wamsuda had been ordered to appear in court over this suspicion, but that he hadn't shown up and authorities had to go bring him in. But there is absolutely no court documentation to back that up. Many of the Wampanoag, including Medicom, believed that Wamsuda had been poisoned. And then Medicom was also summoned before the court, also on suspicion of plotting against the English. In this case, what the colony interpreted as signs of an uprising was probably just a traditional spring festival. Combined with everything that we talked about before the break, this really eroded the last of the goodwill that Osamequin had maintained with the colony. Although all the people that we have just mentioned were men, women were also a critical part of the Wampanoag leadership and in diplomatic relationships with the colony. In particular, Metacom's sister-in-law, Wiedemu, was heavily involved in the events leading up to and during King Philip's War. She was a song squaw, or a squaw sachem, which was a role English colonists often described as queen. It was a role that was on equal footing with a sachem and held by a woman, but this wasn't a position that she had because of her marriage to Wamsuda. It predated that marriage, and it continued after his death in 1662. Yeah, the the colonists referred to the sachems and the squaw sachems as like kings and queens. But the leadership structure was really a lot more about leading and about diplomacy than it was about being a ruler with like authoritative ordering right over people. Right. They were trying to fit it into the European model of monarchy, which it was not. Yeah, So all the factors that we talked about before the break led to the start of King Philip's War, but its immediate precursor was the death of a man known as John Sassamon. Sassamon was an indigenous man whose parents had died in an epidemic, and he was raised in a praying town. These were communities that were established by Puritans for the purpose of converting indigenous people to Christianity and encouraging them to live under English law and following English customs. So the indigenous people that were living in these praying towns were people who converted to Christianity and were adopting like an English colonial lifestyle. Sassamon also attended Harvard for a time before the Indian college there was formally established. Sassamon had worked as an interpreter for the English before becoming one of Medicom's secretaries. And his motivations and actions in all of this really are not clear. There is some suggestion that the English sent him to spy on Medicom. And in late 1674, he reportedly told authorities in Plymouth that Medicom was planning an uprising. The colonial government doesn't seem to have taken this warning seriously. 
And then sometime in early 1675, Sassamon's friends reported that he was missing. After a search, his body was found under the ice in Assawampset Pond in what's now southeastern Massachusetts. Forensics was really not an established discipline at this point. But apart from that, there wasn't much of an examination of Sassamon's body at all. A witness came forward and said that he had seen three of Medicom's counselors murder Sassamon and throw his body into the lake. Authorities had concluded that it had been because Medicom really was planning an uprising and that he'd ordered Sassamon to be killed for betraying him to the English. However, there really was not any evidence for any of this. And there are also a couple of complicating factors. The witness that testified to all of this also owed a gambling debt to one of the counselors that he implicated in the crime. And Asawapset Pond was at the heart of a land dispute involving many of these same people. So it's possible that he was killed and it, like, was something that was ordered because of this whole warning that there was an uprising being planned. It's also possible that he was killed and it was something related to this land dispute. Or he might have just drowned. Like, it's totally unclear. Colonial authorities brought the three counselors involved to trial. To create the appearance of fairness, they assembled a jury that included six indigenous men and 12 colonists. But the trial itself was still pretty shoddy. Uh, This one witness's testimony was really the only thing connecting Medicom's counselors to Sassamon's death, which may or may not have even been a murder. As Tracy said, could have been an accident. The evidence presented at court included a report that when Sassamon's body was brought to Medicom's counselor Tobias, that the corpse started bleeding and that that was evidence of Tobias's guilt. The three counselors were found guilty and sentenced to be hanged on June 8th of 1675. Two of them were executed on that day. The third was given a reprieve after the rope broke, and then he said that he had seen the other two men commit this crime but hadn't participated in it or intervened. By the end of June, though, he had also been executed by firing squad. Regardless of whether Medicom really had been planning some kind of action against the colonists, violence began shortly after these hangings. In early June, several English farms were burned, apparently in retaliation. Then on June 23rd, a colonist in Swansea fatally shot a Wampanoag man while defending his farm from a Wampanoag raid. The next day, in retaliation for that death, a Wampanoag party killed seven colonists in Swansea, which is generally marked as the start of King Philip's War. So if you go read articles about this, you'll often see it described as this series of events that started with the death of John Sassamon, with the trial and the execution leading to this escalating back and forth that tipped into an all-out war. But at the same time, a few weeks before the trial even happened, which was a month before these seven colonists were killed in Swansea, Weedamu had been talking to colonial authorities about her fears that the Wampanoag were going to face persecution by the English. So tensions had clearly been increasing before this trial even began. There was heavy fighting in what is now Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Maine over the next six months. Many of the area's indigenous nations formed an alliance with the Wampanoag. The Mohegans allied with the colonists, as did many of the indigenous people who had converted to Christianity and were living in praying towns. Some, including the Narragansett, tried to stay neutral. At first, colonial forces fared really poorly in the fighting. A lot of them were new recruits to the militia. They really did not have a lot of training, and the training that they did have was really geared toward the style of fighting that was used in Europe. Meanwhile, the indigenous forces' tactics were more like what we might describe as guerrilla warfare today. They were a very highly mobile fighting force with marksmen and snipers and just superior knowledge of the terrain. As this was happening, English authorities viewed indigenous people in general with increasing suspicion. This included people who had converted to Christianity and were living in praying towns. One example was James Printer, who was Nipmuc but had been raised in an English household and educated at Harvard Indian College. In August of 1675, he was captured and accused of participating in a raid when he had actually been in church at that time. Similarly, between 30 and 40 indigenous people were arrested and imprisoned in Cambridge for burning down a haystack that belonged to a man named Amos Richardson, even though Richardson himself insisted that none of them were the culprits. 
On September 18th, an indigenous force ambushed an English convoy that was trying to remove what was left of the harvest from the town of Deerfield. Deerfield had been abandoned in in the wake of the fighting. At least 60 people from the convoy were killed in what came to be known as the Battle of Bloody Brook or the Bloody Brook Massacre. In October of 1675, the Narragansett signed a treaty of neutrality with the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Once they had signed, colonial authorities demanded that they surrender Wampanoag and other refugees who were being sheltered in Narragansett territory. The Narragansett refused this. They considered the refugees to be their kin and under their protection. So the English took this as a sign of duplicity on the Narragansett's part and a suggestion that they might abandon this treaty and join with Medicom. There had also over time been individual Narragansett people who had participated in raids and things like that. So the colonies mustered a militia of about 1,000 people along with about 150 indigenous allies, and they marched to Narragansett territory, burning the indigenous settlements that they passed along the way. On December 19th, fighting began in a swamp in what is now West Kingston, Rhode Island. This became known as the Great Swamp Fight or the Great Swamp Massacre, with the violence stretching into December 20th. At first, the Narragansett were able to drive the English force back, but after the English regrouped and reinforcements arrived, they took the main Narragansett fort, burning it down with people, mostly elders, women, and children, still inside. At least 70 people were killed among the colonial force, with the indigenous death toll much harder to estimate. It was at least 150 people, but it may have been hundreds more. This was really a turning point in the war, so we're going to take a quick sponsor break before we move on. After the Great Swamp Massacre, the Narragansett Nation unsurprisingly went to war against the colonies. Narragansett Sachem Kananchit formed a coalition with other indigenous tribes and nations, which mustered a fighting force of about 2,000 in what's now Rhode Island. He then moved into central Massachusetts and organized another force of about 1,500 people. As Kananchit was forming this coalition, the weather was hampering the colonists' efforts in the war. Late December of 1675 was very snowy, with militia commanders reporting depths between two and three feet of snow. It wasn't at all conducive to the militia's movements, especially since they didn't know exactly where the indigenous forces were at any point. The indigenous forces were affected as well, but they continued to be a lot more mobile than the colonial forces were, thanks to having more experience dealing with this kind of weather and being more familiar with a lot of the territory outside the colonial towns. Yeah, it was also just a lot easier for a small, like, raiding party in snowshoes to come in and hit a place and leave than it was for, like, a militia unit to march somewhere. In the early months of 1676, these two indigenous fronts moved northward and eastward through southern New England. They converged in Providence, Rhode Island, which the indigenous force burned down in March of 1676, By the spring, in the face of these two advancing armies, the English had abandoned at least 11 towns in Massachusetts, and the indigenous force had destroyed most of the colonial towns in Rhode Island on the west side of Narragansett Bay. But as the weather got warmer in the spring, there was another shift. New England's indigenous community had been on the move through the winter, whether it was the fighting force advancing through the colony or women, children, and elders who were trying to stay out of the way of the war. Fewer crops had been planted because people couldn't stay in one place to tend them. And what did get planted was often destroyed by the colonial militia. For example, in May of 1676, an English force attacked a Nipmuc camp that had been established specifically for fishing and planting. The colonial militia massacred many of the people who were there, who were mostly, again, women, children, and elders. This was about 200 people. Then an indigenous force that was nearby regrouped and killed about 40 of the militia. This continued into June, with the colonial militia arranging raids to destroy the indigenous people's crops and to force them away from their cultivated fields. Indigenous forces and refugees alike simply started running out of food. Then, on July 20th, Benjamin Church led a force that attacked Metacom's encampment, capturing his wife and child and selling them into slavery. Metacom was also captured and was assassinated on August 12th of 1676. His body was drawn and quartered, and his head was placed on a pike and displayed outside of Plymouth. 
That same month, Wiedemu drowned while trying to cross a river as she was fleeing from colonial forces. Kananchet was also captured and killed in 1676. Medicom's death is often described as the end of King Philip's War. But in reality, the indigenous forces had been losing ground for months, and fighting continued, particularly in what's now Maine, for months. A treaty formally ended the fighting along the Northern Front on April 12, 1678, almost two years after Medicom's death. The idea that the war was King Philip's and that it ended with his death really came from Benjamin Church's Entertaining History of King Philip's War, which was published in 1716. That story recounted his own role in pursuing and killing Medicom through the stories that he had told to his son. Church's account is one of many written from the colonial perspective in the 17th and early 18th centuries. Colonists actually started writing books about this war before the war was even over. Increase Mather published A Brief History of the War with the Indians in New England in 1676, and William Hubbard published A Narrative of the Trouble with the Indians in New England in 1677. We also have Mary Rowlandson's A Narrative of the Captivity and Restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, which was published in 1682. Rowlandson and her children were taken captive after a raid on Lancaster. One of her children was injured and died shortly afterward, and Rowland and her surviving children spent almost three months as captives. They wound up with a party led by Wiedemu as she tried to guide refugees to safety. Rowlandson's account has been described as North America's first bestseller, and it launched the genre of the captivity narrative. By the end of this war, about 600 colonists and British soldiers had been killed. About 17 English settlements were completely destroyed or abandoned, and at least 50 others were heavily damaged. The death toll on the indigenous side is harder to say precisely, but it was probably in the thousands. It's estimated that about 5% of New England's white population was killed as a result of the war, with 40% of the indigenous population either being killed or fleeing the region. At least 1,000 indigenous people were also enslaved and sent out of New England. This included people who surrendered with the hope that they would be treated leniently. The colonists had enslaved indigenous people starting before the war, but they really expanded the practice during and afterward. Prior to the war, colonists had enslaved indigenous people to make money, to take their land, and to punish and remove anyone who was viewed as a negative influence on other indigenous people. During and after King Philip's War, most of the enslaved indigenous men were sent to Barbados or to other British territory in the Caribbean. But a few were sent to other places as well. Enslaved indigenous women and children were often forced to work in British households and businesses in North America. And in some cases, this enslavement became hereditary, with children who were born to enslaved indigenous women being claimed as the property of the households where these women were being forced to work. English attitudes toward the indigenous people became much harsher in the wake of the war. The colonies passed prohibitions on selling weapons to indigenous people, and that was later expanded to selling anything to them. The colonies also organized patrols to police indigenous communities and their movements. In May of 1766, Massachusetts ordered that all indigenous people in the colony's territory had to live in one of four praying towns. Further laws were passed in the early 18th century, often with laws targeting the indigenous population being looped into laws that were related to enslaved Africans. As for the colonists, the British government dispatched Edward Randolph to investigate the causes of the war and to assess the damage. He reported that the colonists generally believed that it had been divine punishment for their own sinfulness— After he made this report, the English colonies in New England lost a lot of their autonomy. They became part of the Dominion of New England, which was placed under the control of New York Governor Edmund Andros. Of the hundreds of indigenous tribes and nations in New England before and during King Philip's War, only a few remain today. In terms of nations that have come up in today's episode, there's the Mohegan tribe of Indians of Connecticut, the Narragansett Indian tribe of Rhode Island, and in Massachusetts, the Mashpee Wampanoag and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead, Aquina. Of course, there are also tribes that still exist but don't have federal recognition. The Nipmuc Nation is recognized by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but not by the federal government. Yeah, and there are also tribes that exist and are not recognized by any state or government body. 
There are a lot of books about King Philip's War, and they all offer their own interpretation of what happened and why, and this includes a lot of books written within the last few decades. And that understanding is going to continue to evolve. In terms of the Wampanoag perspective in particular, the Wampanoag adopted reading and writing from the colonists in the 17th century, but the Wampanoag language was nearly lost in the centuries that followed. That has changed recently thanks to the work of Jessie Littledo Baird, who was awarded a MacArthur grant for her efforts to revive the Wampanoag language in 2010. So as more people become fluent in Wampanoag, that's going to open another avenue of research for historians. I read a lot of resources for this uh, show, but the book that I read um, was Our Beloved Kin, A New History of King Philip's War by Lisa Brooks. Th- that is not so much, if you're thinking of a, a book about a war in history, it's not a book that's like this happened and then this happened and then this happened. It is more looking at all the factors of the war from different angles, including like close readings of different land deeds and letters and captivity narratives and all of that stuff. Um, It is really interesting and is a lot more about um, the Wampanoag perspective and other indigenous perspectives than some of the other uh, books that are out there. Folks are interested in that. It also has a really fascinating companion website that is full of maps and pictures and all kinds of other stuff. So... I feel like the point about the uh, revival of um, the Wampanoag language and that opening a new avenue of research is either something that was in that book or something in one of the other things that I read as I was researching this. Do you also have a little bit of listener mail to read? I do. It's a correction. Sometimes we make mistakes and it's like, oh, I didn't know that. That's an error I made. Sometimes we make mistakes and I did know that. And that's extra embarrassing. (laughs) Um, And that's what happened this time. This is a letter from Mark, and Mark is one of a few people that wrote to us about this. Mark says, hi, Holly and Tracy, I recently discovered your podcast, and I'm so very glad I did. Fascinating topics coupled with your fun and fetching presentation styles have made it my favorite podcast for my early morning 60 minutes commute to work. I was listening to a recent Six Impossible episode show and heard you mention the impeachment of Nixon. I'm sure a lot of listeners have already reached out about this, but just a reminder that Nixon was not impeached. He was threatened with impeachment, but resigned before suffering through what appeared to be an inevitable end. I know you two like to be accurate, so there it is. Keep it coming. We are listening. Cheers. Mark, thank you, Mark, and the others who have written to us or tweeted at us or Facebook commented (laughs) at us about this. Uh, To recap... The impeachment process of Richard Nixon had started. There had been months of impeachment hearings and investigations, and the House Judiciary Committee had approved articles of impeachment on three different charges that happened in late July of 1974. But the House did not actually vote on those articles because Nixon announced his resignation on August 8th of 1974, and he left the White House the next day. So there was no one left in office I mean, there was someone left in office, but, like, Nixon was not in office to impeach anymore. So instead, the House adopted a resolution that accepted that uh, the House Judiciary's report on the whole matter. This all gets shorthanded to impeached a lot <laughs> because, like, it had gone on for all of that time and included various impeachment proceedings. But, like, there was no actual vote on the impeachment articles, Um It really seemed incredibly likely that he was going to be impeached by the House and then convicted by the Senate, but technically that vote never happened. So um, even though it gets glossed over with the word impeachment a lot, technically not impeach, impeached, resigned from office to avoid that fate. (laughs) Uh, Anyway. Yeah, I 100% knew that from eighth grade civics class or whatever, and it's, I just wrote it wrong. I wrote it wrong in the thing and didn't catch it. Anyway, so thank you to the folks who have brought that up. Uh, gave me a chance to say it the right way. If you would like to write to us, we are at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. We're also all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Pinterest, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, anywhere else to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 